Fantastic. Um, well, it's 11.03, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Um, at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A button for all of our participants to use. So if Daniel begins talking about something that you guys think is really interesting or you have a question, go ahead and um, put it in the Q&A box and we can either have our panelists answer it via text or Daniel can answer it live at the end, potentially showing you guys a demo. Um, so thank you guys for coming to I Can't Believe It's Not SQL, an introduction to Power Query M, hosted by um, one of our senior data analysts, Daniel Villarreal. So a little bit of background on Iron Edge before we get started is that we are a managed services and Power BI consulting firm located in Houston, Texas with an office in San Antonio. We have Power BI and managed services clients all throughout the Americas. We're going on business almost 15 years. And over the past five to six years, we've really developed a unique Power BI delivery model. Some of the things that we help our existing clients with are proof of concepts reports. Um, BI as a service where we come in and act as a fully outsourced team of consultants to help augment your business and help you guys with uh, the entirety of the Power Platform. Um, our team loves to do training engagements as well as projects and solutions, whether that's waterfall projects or um, data strategies. Um, so if you guys have any questions, you're looking at implementing a Power BI or Power Platform strategy for your business, um, feel free to reach out to sales at ironedgegroup.com and I'd love to get you in touch with one of our <laughs> smart guys. Um, that being said, Let's dive into the meat of this webinar, and I'll let Daniel go ahead and kick it off by giving y'all an introduction on him. All right, hello everybody. Here's a, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Daniel Villarreal Jr. I am a certified uh, Microsoft Solutions Associate uh, for Business Intelligence. This re uh, required, you know, some intensive tests in both Microsoft Excel's um, Power Pivot and also Power BI. A quick little uh, note about that is if any of you out there are looking to get certified um, as well in business intelligence, I would say definitely take the Excel test first. It'll prepare you a lot better, but um, there's a lot of content in this um, presentation that will prepare you for both of those tests, especially for the Power Query side, just getting you acquainted with Power Query if you are not familiar with it. But moving on, I'm uh, one of the data analysts over at Iron Edge Group in the business intelligence department. Uh, I help organize the Houston Power BI user group and I got my uh, education in computer information systems at um, the Uni University of Houston. Um, you can reach me here at uh, my business email and here is my LinkedIn. And without further ado, let's get started. So getting started, what exactly is Power Query M. Microsoft officially defines Power Query, Query M as a formula language that's optimized for building highly flexible data mashup queries. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, wordage in there. And uh, just to break it down a little bit, it's a functional and case sensitive language, meaning that you can use Power Query to actually define practical functions to manipulate, manipulate your data in ways that can leverage conditional logic, they can reference lists, and you can even define variables. If you've ever used Visual Basic for applications, it's very similar just in the sense that you're defining steps that iterate the sequence to produce a practical outcome. Um, I'd say it's very easy to learn, uh, get familiar with, but it's much, much harder to master. Um, Power Query M essentially defines your queries that make up your data model, so it's best that you set yourself up for success in the query editor. Uh, what this means is, you know, moving beyond just GUI, um, actions and using operations that are found in the menu options. Um, so, you know, it's a, a little bit harder to master, but there's this very cool image that Greg found when studying for uh, learning Power Query M. This is the M learning curve, and it shows the percentage of problems that can be solved over time uh, as you learn Power Query M. So, right here, once you have a basic familiarity, familiarity with it, 
Um, typically you can work with the UI only, which means you know you use the ribbon at the top of your Power Query editor to do any of the actions while selecting columns and doing things like that. Uh, as you move on, you can sort of edit the steps that you create from the GUI using the formula bar at the top. The formula bar for anyone who is not familiar with it, we can discuss that later, but it just, um, you know, the formula bar at the top, you turn it on either using the ribbon option at the top, or you can turn it on in your settings. Then as you move on, being able to define M in your custom columns is a huge step, which means that, you know, you create a custom column and using freehand M, you're defining the simple logic using M for that column. Um, as you move along, you can start using custom functions and the advanced editor and advanced iterations like list.accumulate and list.generate. These go hand in hand with some functions that kind of use a lot of logic. Um, with these list.accumulate and generates, um, you could actually potentially leverage you know, outcomes of groups of rows and be able to do conditional logic on using this step if you, know, you have values that reach this specific threshold or use a different step um, if you are under that threshold. And finally, you know, being almost a master means you can just freeform code in the advanced editor. Um, I don't think many people like this exist aside from Microsoft devs themselves, but you know, uh, just to give you a little bit of insight, me and my team, we float somewhere between 80 and 95%. Um, what this means is we're very, very comfortable with defining M in our custom columns just by defining them uh, based on business rules that we hear. And furthermore, we can kind of make some custom functions using the advanced editor and iterators just by, um, for example, uh, a big example of uh, me using iterators in my Power Query is whenever I have to use uh, lists of pages in REST or RESTful APIs where I need to define a page uh, number that I can iterate through. So I literally make a table from one through 10, 20, 30, whatever it may be, just so that I can pull that amount of uh, pages from an API. So moving on to the actual content, um, we're going to be talking a lot about the advanced editor and I just wanna let you know what the advanced editor is. So some of you may have seen it, maybe you've opened it up, but you didn't know what it was, but the advanced editor in the Power Query editor screen shows the true definition of your query in Power Query M. What you see in the, when you open the advanced editor is the full Power Query definition of your query. The advanced editor can be considered to have a direct relationship with the applied steps on the right-hand side of the query editor. I'm sure you've seen this grow as you've done actions upon your queries. Each name step you see in the advanced editor translates to an applied step in the applied steps menu. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, we will break down what is going on and how to read it in a few slides. But overall, some people get away with never interacting with the advanced editor. Typically, those people who do not interact with the advanced editor find that the GUI action and the ribbon are, su are sufficient to meet their data ingestion and formatting goals. Therefore, you can either love it or leave it in terms of learning how to work with the advanced editor, but I do recommend learning to love it. So what exactly is going on in the advanced editor? What I have here is just a simple screenshot from a few actions done through the GUI um, of pulling data down from a JSON, um, you know, converting it to a table, expanding the column and changing some types and renaming some columns. So let me break it down for you. If you look at the picture on the left, there is a, um, keyword let and a keyword blue or in blue and a keyword in much further down in blue as well. These steps you see in the advanced editor each accomplish a transformation or action upon the data. Beginning with the source, the source typically is automatically named as a key hold for your Power Query definition. This step um, is generated whenever you bring in a data source using the get data or um, the new data source. Um, it brings in the data in either a table or list format. I'm sure some of you have had to click uh, to table from list uh, in your GUI just to be able to begin working on the data. So as you act upon the data through transformations or additions, a new applied step is created. Power BI automatically names the steps based on the type of action done in that step. So finally, as you move along and you reach your last step, while acting upon the data. The step after the in keyword is your final step. So it is the step that defines your, your final output. 
So what you need to remember when you're looking at Power Query is that it is table in, table out, which means each one of these steps is technically a table in and of itself. It's a table that has been uh, worked upon through a transformation or an addition through a column, but each one of these can be defined as a step. So this last step right here, renamed columns, is technically the table I want to be displayed. So this in keyword shows me that this is the table I'll be seeing at the end. So here's some common statements in Power Query, uh, remembering that the output of every line of M is a list or table. Um, here are some common sightings you'll see in the advanced editor. So there's table.from list. This is a function that turns a list into a table. It's extremely simple. The target of this function needs to be a list and the output is just that list defined as a table to Power Query. Very simple. Um, you know, very basic. The table.transform columns, this function takes the table's column and transforms it by leveraging another function that acts upon the data specifically. So, you know, this is just a function and we need to pick a column afterwards. So I'll show you what that looks like later on. So each of these table functions does a good job at hinting at what it does. You know, uh, M is very good at self-describing in terms of its functionality. Of course, knowing these functions doesn't mean you've mastered it. Being able to write them freehand is typically a sign that you're getting close. But to be able to write Power Query, it's imperative to know how to read and understand a Power Query statement first. So let's break down a Power Query statement. So what we have here is a basic rename columns uh, step. It's uh, a step auto-generated in Power Query just by me clicking on a column name and then renaming it. So first we see the actual step name right here in red. When I double clicked on the column name and entered a new column name, this step was created immediately. So it's important to know that the pound sign right in front of the step name is only there because the step name has a space in it. This is why the source step has no single quotes or sign or pound sign in front of it. So whenever you see that source step, it's a single word with no spaces, therefore it doesn't need the pound uh, single quotes applied to it. The next thing we move on to is the step definition. Everything in this area is going to be the step definition. In this case, it is the table rename columns, which is our function that we're using. And the function call has specific parameters like any other function in any other programming language. So we have to provide the parameters in parentheses. The function rename columns needs to actually act upon a table object. And in this, in most cases, this is the previous step name that uh, we did before. So the previous step itself had an output of a table and we are now acting upon that output table by renaming a column in it. Next, we have to actually target a column that we're changing the name of along with the name of the new, uh, the new name of the same column. Together, all of this makes up the parameters for the function and therefore we can semantically say, take the table defined in the change type step and rename the column area to area with kilometer squared in the parentheses. So just to reiterate, we take the table to find and change type and rename the column area to area kilometer squared. So here are some things to keep in mind when thinking about Power Query M. Um, whenever you're writing Power Query, uh, you can do line breaks and commas outside of a function call or parentheses in general, mark the end of a statement. Meaning, you know, if you have a column, if you have a comma placed somewhere uh, inappropriately, or if you have two commas in a row outside of any fu function call where you're not skipping a parameter, then you will get a syntax error. You can declare local variables both inside and outside of a let call. Meaning, you know, if you wanted to define a variable, whether it's another step from another table or a variable that you've defined in your Power Query itself, you can you know, kind of place those and kind of uh, configure them outside of your let call before you even bring them in so it doesn't interrupt the flow of your steps. You can also implement common patterns like if else statements. And a very important thing to remember is that M is case sensitive. So you can't just capitalize random letters like I have a very bad habit of doing. Um, enabling IntelliSense is extremely helpful, especially when implementing any more than basic logic or functions. If you have any questions about enabling IntelliSense, um, I think Greg, who is one of the panelists, might be able to answer that question if you just propose it. And 
the final most important thing to remember is that there is no undo in Power Query. All you can do is delete a step or comment it out. There's no redo or undo in Power Query at all. And we will discuss how to manage this restraint later on when we're talking about optimizing our code and making sure everything stays nice and uh, keeping it from being redundant. So as we revisit this anatomy of a Power Query statement, some of you may realize that this looks more familiar without having ever opened up the advanced editor. And like I had talked about before, if you have the formula bar turned on, then this scenario may seem familiar to you. Um, you have your column called area and you rename it using the ribbon. You go ahead and rename your column. Then your formula bar goes from looking like this, which is the previous step to looking like this. This is all done with the simple action of renaming your column and it's because you've created a new step in your Power Query. However, this could be your lead into writing your own code and modifying it. Um, this is a little bit of a preview going into um, our next slide, but you know it's simple enough to just add another rename by typing it freehand with the same syntax here. So we'll go on. Here is an example. Uh, we have a removed column step and the table remove columns. If I wanted to remove another column and I see this in my Power Query, I could actually just make a, um, I could add a comma here and just start removing more columns by targeting them. So how can we use Power Query to avoid redundant work? Power Query M code can actually be copied and pasted in a blank query in any report. This is extremely useful when you have to query the same data source uh, several times, but transform it in different ways. So, you know, you can start to initialize your one data source and instead of having to do so over and over again, uh, bringing in the same data source from the GUI, you could actually just copy and paste the steps that um, initialize that connection over and over again into new blank queries. But because of the fact that there's no undo in Power Query M, you can get yourself into a lot of hot water when you're saving, when you're making heavy edits to your production tables. Saving does help, but recovering save states requires opening older versions. To protect yourself in times of heavy editing, it is simple enough to either duplicate a query before you begin working on it, or copying and pasting the code from the advanced editor into something like Notepad or any other text editor. Doing this simple action will actually save you a lot of headache when you have to go back to a working state in your query. I've had several times where I'm trying to turn a 30 step um, table into something closer to about 10 steps, but I mess up along the way and the code is just so heavy that I don't know where my mistake was and I need to revert back. So having that save state really does help. So you can, uh, Kind of what I was talking about earlier where we can combine similar statements. It's very common to do operations in pairs and what I mean by this is I see a lot of times whenever I'm working with a client's data or their Power BI reports that they may have gone through their Power Query and renamed a column and then changed its type and then renamed another column and then changed its type and so on and so forth. Um, this leads to a single action um, happening over and over again. So you'll have you know, your applied steps look like renamed column, change type, rename column one, change type one, and so on and so forth. Um, it can be extremely um, overbearing on your Power Query to have these pairs done in your applied steps. And what it does is it, over time, actually starts to slow down your evaluation for your Power Query. So it can be avoided by grouping steps together. You can combine all of your similar steps in the advanced editor, or you can choose to just do your uh, actions all at once. You can do all of your renames, you can do all of your change types, and you can then remove your columns. Um, combining the similar steps overall is a best practice for optimizing your queries. It also helps a lot whenever someone inherits your Power Query to have to work on it as well. So here's an example. If your applied steps look something like this, you know, rename, change type, rename, change type, then your Power Query code looks something like this, where we have these same functions being called and same functions being called. Not, not only does this add more steps, but it can potentially slow down your Power Query evaluation. So instead of having multiple steps for the same action, you see these blue actions right here. These are all the same type. We can then collapse them by just 
opening up the syntax and copying the targets of my function and putting them all into a single line and then taking the change types and then collapsing them into a single step as well. I've, by doing this, I've turned four steps into two. And there are several functions that can take multiple col uh, columns as parameters. You just need to look into what the definition of that function is. So once again, this saves you a lot of headache. And when things get really long in terms of your applied steps, this can actually slow down your refreshes, your evaluations. You can actually cause timeouts if your data model is that big. So just uh, something to keep in mind and something we highly recommend. But um, this isn't just an introduction to Power Query. We are going to talk about some very similar uh, SQL operations that we can find in Power Query that you know, many of you may be familiar with with SQL if uh, you are fam more familiar with SQL than you are with anything else in, um, in terms of business intelligence. So I'll walk through a few examples of you know, pseudo SQL inside of Power Query. So I'm not sure where this box came from. My bad, everybody. Uh, using Power Query instead of SQL. So although many SQL function, SQL-like functions exist within Power Query M operations in the GUI, it is still important to understand how to keep your Power Query optimized. Every time you're previewing the data, Power BI is evaluating, evaluating your M and actually communicating with the database and pulling top records to show examples of how your data is gonna be formatted. When dealing with larger data models or heavy transformations, it's very important to make sure that you are offloading a lot of compute power onto the server, where the hardware can keep up with SQL queries instead of your laptop that has, you know, eight gigs of RAM and a slow processor. You know, we don't all get to pick our laptops that we use for work. So if you know for a fact that your data source is weakly powered or you are operating on a non-SQL data source, these common operations in SQL can actually be found in Power Query without the need for, M, for custom M writing. You can do merges and appends, even from disparate data, data sources, as long as they are formatted similar, similarly for appends, or they have a common key for merges. You can pivot and unpivot data to allow for summary level metrics. And you can even group by rows to create rollups of your data to quickly define your pivot, a, a pivot table, like a pivot like table based on a few grouping fields. So here is just a few of the um, options we're gonna be using. We've now moved on from a focus on you writing freehand Power Query to using the GUI to leverage SQL-like operations to quickly get set up inside of Power BI to make your data model much more powerful. So we're gonna start with merges. Merges are essentially the equivalent to SQL joins but the benefit for doing joins in Power Query is that the data from your left table can be from something like an Azure SQL database and your right table can be from a MySQL database as long as they have keys that are very similar or that are similar and come from and are describing the same things. So there are also options for several types of joins. We have left, right, and full outer joins. We have inner joins and we have left and right anti-joins for the people that have to deal with insane data sources. The merges when using the GUI establish the join logic based on the order shown in the preview screen. And after selecting your tables for the merge and how to merge them, you'll be able to pull specific fields from the second table using the GUI. So, you know, let's say I have this table, sales to merge. This is going to be the table that I choose to, uh, to merge from. And then we have our second table product where I want to join them on the product ID and a Ultimately, I'm only going to bring this product field, the, the name of the product into my sales table so that I can actually describe my sales with a product name instead of a product ID. But moving on, we can also do appends. Appends are equivalent to unions in SQL, but they're a little bit more forgiving in a lot of aspects. You can append two or even three or more tables together. It's extremely important to note, however, that the append logic is based on actual field names. So if you want a perfect union, the tables being appended must have the same number of columns with the same field names between them. Um, when you don't have a match for a column in either table, you get a column that has null values for the rows in the, from the table that did not have the column from the other. I commonly see people reorder their columns to match the order from each table in the append, but this is actually not necessary and is adding an unnecessary step to your 
um, applied steps, the order log the order will be inherited from the first table in the append logic. So whether I'm picking um, one of these tables and appending it to the other, the order does not matter, only field names and data types to an extent. Moving on, pivoting and unpivoting, you'll find them in the transform ribbon, uh, transform menu of the ribbon. Pivoting and unpivoting data is useful when transforming pivoted data that needs to be unpivoted or unpivoted data that needs to be pivoted. It's typically something that if you need to do, you know you need to do it. Um, we won't be going too deep into this subject, but I will say that it is more common to unpivot data, especially when you're dealing with spreadsheets that contain data entered on a very low level transactional level. Um, to pivot a column, you just need to select a column and then press the pivot button. And to unpivot a column, you have a few options. Um, you can either unpivot the columns you have selected, you can unpivot other columns or specifically limit the logic to the columns you have selected. So pivoting and unpivoting, some of you may not see this. If you've ever done the dashboard in the day training, you, you've seen uh, kind of the forced example that Microsoft creates for it. But I will say that pivoting and unpivoting is extremely useful when you have just a mess of spreadsheets going on that someone told you to visualize. So it can be extremely useful, but for a lot of summary level metrics, I find that the group by is one of the most um, useful operations for our summary tables. Um, group by, um, although grouping is typically not recommended as Power BI operates best with granular data, this is one of the easiest ways to quickly get a summary table complete with counts, sums, averages, and even distinct mins and maxes for a single column spit out into, split out into two new columns. Um, I'll be going through you know, slight demos of each if uh, you know, the audience requests specific functionality, but feel free to ask questions to the panelists to have me highlight certain aspects as I go through this. So you know, with, with Group by, I have a simple sales table. And what I want to do is take the salesperson ID and the product ID of my uh, sales table and just get the number of sales by counting the rows. Very simple. Don't even need to define a column to count. Um, just the rows in the actual table since the rows represent, each row represents a sale and the total volume, which is going to be the sum of the price of each one of my sales. So that's going to give me the total volume. And just by doing this, I can get a table that shows me each salesperson by product and shows me the number of sales they had for that product and the total like price volume of those sales. And that's an extremely quick way to get a summary table. Um, one of the most common reasons I personally would use a summary table is for row level security, but that's a little bit um, of a different topic. And if anyone has questions about that, um, I can happily answer it. So right now uh, we don't really have a focus on the demos. I can demo any of the specific um, SQL functions that we've had. If anyone has uh, you know, questions about more detailed ways to accomplish merges, appends, um, group buys, or even unpivots, we can go through those demos. But if not, um, we're also opening the floor to questions. So feel free to use the Q&A section or raise your hand to ask a question. Um, if anyone out there has anything that they're specifically curious about what we've covered, even the advanced editor or Power Query M as a whole. So I see AJ has asked if we, you can group merge steps. I'm a little bit confused on, oh, well, Greg would like to answer this question. So Greg, if you wanna- I was more marking it for you, but oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, so what do you mean by grouping merge steps exactly? So grouping merge steps is definitely not going to be something you can do if you're talking about merging you know, one table and then merging one further down the line. Merging is a little bit more complex in the sense that, you know, you need your target table and the table you're joining it to. So those can't be uh, grouped together the way that we do, you know, rename columns or anything like that. Um, it's very one dimensional. Is it possible to do if and else query using two tables? Um, Aaron, so for your question, using an if and else query, uh, I think you mean if you're able to do two different data sources, and um, you know, do conditional logic for a column or anything like that. 
Um, yes, you can, but you would probably want to do a merge on the two tables first so that you can have that reference field. Otherwise, a lot of that logic may be kicked to DAX if you're trying to look at two different tables. Um, the thing about Power Query is you always wanna keep in mind how much compute you're using and how much evaluation time things are gonna take. So if you're doing if and else using actual queries, you know, like, um, you know, say you wanna use this query in place of this one. If, you know, you don't mean meet certain uh, func if you don't meet certain criteria, uh, that is possible, but that goes into a little bit more advanced power query where we're using actual functions uh, as queries. So you wouldn't necessarily create a new table by pulling two columns. You would just merge in the columns that you're doing the um, conditional logic on. And AJ, for uh, improving refresh performance, we actually have a lot of content about that. We do uh, some um, presentations about it, but overall, one thing to keep in mind uh, is that collapsing of steps is definitely a big deal, um, especially if you know we see a lot of people that work on Power Query and reorder steps to what they're doing at the time. If you ever reorder a table that isn't specifically necessary for your display layer on the front end of your report, uh, you know whether you open the data view, if you don't need that reorder steps uh, aside from your Power Query development, delete those steps because the, generally the less steps you have, the better uh, in your Power Query. But you know, moving on from just the applied steps, you got to also keep in mind how much are we putting onto Power Query's actual data load. So am I doing a merge and then doing conditional logic and then doing an append and then doing another merge? You kind of have to be a little bit, um, uh, a little bit more um, informed about how you order your merges and appends. You know, do uh, is it possible to rename and change types of all of your uh, columns before you do a merge? Because if if so, then you're not referencing two different things in the memory. You may not be dealing with two different data sources that are trying to evaluate at the same time. Whether it's like an Excel spreadsheet that you're transforming heavily and then querying a SQL database to put them all together, because you almost want to think about optimizing your Power Query as if you're optimizing a SQL query because there is always going to be communication to the data source as it's evaluating each step and going further. Hey, Daniel. Um, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I wanted to add on to what you, the question you were just answering and combining a little bit with the question that John is just answering. That's and great. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I, you mentioned this, but just if you can control the columns that are being brought in, from your source, that's one of the best ways to also to uh, to, to improve your refresh uh, performance. Uh, so if it's possible to not bring in every single column, if you can do that, uh, like especially with SQL, it's an easy one to not bring in every every column into your Power Query. It'll really help with your refresh performance. Exactly. And also, uh, Greg, you, you think about this a lot is the content in your actual columns as well. So mm -hmm. there have been times where we queried sources that have actual email contents in them. And emails can actually really bog down your data. I mean, some of you may not ever run into this. But if you ever run into anything that carries messages or free text fields in your data, those can actually be extremely, extremely overbearing on your evaluation type. So that's something to also keep in mind is the actual content of your fields and how big is the data that you're storing. Um, John asked, um, with similar functionality in both M and SQL, what types of activities would best be performed in one or the other? So going back to what I was talking about earlier, you have to keep in mind how powerful the server that you're querying is, but also what the functionality of the data sources are. So if, you'll, if you've got two tables that you know need to be either joined or merged together, it's always going to be best to do that in the SQL query when bringing things in because that's going to be your source step and that is the server that you're querying that is going to be taking control of that. But if you, know, you need to merge um, a dimensional Excel table that is going to have keys or translate keys into actual descriptions, and you need to have those in your tables, then it might be a good idea. Then the only option you really have is to query a 
data source or a table in SQL and then merge it using Power Query to um, your SQL query. So if you can't accomplish merges or appends and unions inside of a database query, then doing it in M is almost required. But there are times where, you know, I will develop in Power Query M and then as I kind of get a better picture of what I need my data to look like in Power Query, I'll start to write a SQL query that will replace all of the steps that I've done inside of Power Query and only keep the things that I know I need to do in Power Query. Um, Greg, did you want to add on to this? Yeah, yeah. I would say uh, one thing that's much that's pretty easy to do in Power in Power Query that I don't think there's performance that much of a performance advantage to do in SQL is um, conditional columns. So if you you can write uh, a, a case statement in SQL that can meet your conditional column needs. I, I, my own little limited testing is that it's not really much of a performance increase and it's much harder to update and edit if you need to quickly change uh, your conditional column to say, you know, kind of a if this and that. So I would keep that in Power Query versus SQL just for more for your own time than, than any sort of performance uh, issue. And then um, I did want to add when you brought up uh, emails, Daniel, uh, date times. So if you have a lot of, in terms of refreshing your data, if you have a lot of date time fields, especially if you're not using them, uh, you know, drop them from your from your query uh, if you can. And then the otherwise, uh, Daniel, I think you mentioned it in your presentation, maybe uh, splitting, or maybe it was just now you mentioned splitting columns. That That's another one too. So, um, you know, taking your date time, if you have a date time field, uh, the uh, granularity of like the uniqueness of date time, because it's, it, you know, if you have a million date time uh, rows, then that's basically almost a million unique values. So you could, if you split them into a date column and a time column, it reduces the the cardinality and uh, makes it a lot uh, faster for performance. So, yes, um, that was much better uh, for from than my explanation. Much much more specific. Um, when pivoting the columns into rows, uh, this was from Nikhil. Um, when pivoting columns into rows, all the blanks are converted to zeros, and I'm unable to count the blank values. So. Nikhil, there's actually a simple way to deal with this. Um, all of the blanks that you have, it may be a good idea to first, um, what the blanks you're actually referring to are null values and Power Query isn't going to do anything with those null values. So what you can do is actually replace the null value with something like a flag for blanks or just the actual word blank. And then you'll be able to count those blank rows. Um, the nulls are going to be um, by design um, removed from that pivot because technically there's no usable data there. So if you just replace null values by typing null into the find box and blank into the uh, replace box, then you'll be able to actually count the times blank shows up. So that might be a little bit, um, uh, that might be a better way to um, kind of fix or, it, you know, deal with that issue. Cassandra, did you have something to add? Oh, no, I didn't. Oh, I just wanted okay. to mark it as live. Oh, okay. So the anonymous attendee, I see that you asked identifying sources that move, uh, you know, an efficient way of changing the code reference, the source folder is moved to another location. So there's actually, you know, a not so elegant way to do this, but something that will save you a lot of time. So you can either do it one of two ways uh, dealing with the source step. So if your data source moved, you know, and you have tons of transformations after you've defined the target data source, you know, you can have your query that's not working anymore and then duplicate that query and then, not, well, hold on, let me back up a second. So you can have your Power Query code for what was a production table. And then if you bring in a new data source where that new data source folder is, then you know, just bring that in, look at the source step and replace the source step from the, um, the production version of the query. So you would just copy that source step and replace the source step from the um, production ready uh, query. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is the essentially reverse way where you just you know, take that source step and then that new blank query, you bring in the new data source, and then you copy and paste all of the actions that are done. So basically everything after the source step and copy and paste it into that, and then 
overall replace the production query with the text from the new query. Um, one thing to keep in mind about Power Query and how Power BI, you know, kind of looks at it, there is the name of your query, but then there's also, you know, some hash in the background where everything's being evaluated, where there's an actual, you know, memory storage location for that query. So even if you bring in a new query and name it what the previous query was called, they're technically not replacing it. It is just a new query that isn't going to inherit the relationships on your relationship view or anything on the front end. Um, your measures won't act upon it or anything. So if you have two, actually, let me go ahead and kind of illustrate this a little bit better with my screen here. If I had product right here as one of my production queries and I need to work on it and I change the definition of this product for this duplication one, and this is now you know, defined as the query that I want to work with just by renaming this to product will not satisfy, you know, my business rules, my measures, anything like that inside of the actual report. What I would need to do is take the advanced editor definition of this new updated table and copy and paste it into the old version. So what this is going to do is actually take the place of that query without having to set up new relationships or anything like that. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're um, moving or changing data sources. Um, sometimes it's as simple as changing the URL that's targeting a SharePoint folder as well, though. Um, if you know the shorthand uh, root folder for the SharePoint file, then and the business logic for targeting the file that you're heading to inside of a SharePoint, you can just change the URL and hopefully it will, um, you know, be able to just find it using the filter logic that you've established. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, Kevin asked, can you merge join multiple tables in one step? So you can, you, you can append multiple tables in one step. You cannot merge multiple tables in one step. There is, you know, a specific join logic that needs to go on and you need to merge all of your tables one after the other. You can't, you know, um, you can't discreetly merge multiple tables in a single step. So, I, would, I would add, Daniel, I, I think you could like, you know, put the nest the steps, but uh, into one step, you can nest all the functions, but I don't think you're gonna get much of a performance or anything else increasing that. And it's just gonna be a big mess. No, so. Yeah, actually, I would, I would wager that it would actually worsen performance if you tried to nest those functions. Yeah, yeah, so I, I'm very anti nesting. So yeah, I don't yes. think it really helps much. A follow-up question to what was mentioned a little while ago, would you be able to show how you can control data columns you want to pull in with Power Query? So um, we might be able to show that off, but essentially what we mean by that is, you know, if I were to connect to a database, I can't really show you an example of connecting to a database since it's all sensitive data, but if you're connecting to a database by just entering the connection string like the server and the database that you're connecting to and you don't specify a SQL query, then you'll be presented with the navigational hierarchy of that database and you'll be able to select different tables from it. But essentially what that's doing is doing a select star on that table. So you're pulling in all of the columns, but a way to select the columns is going to be um, something like, you know, just selecting the columns you want in a SQL query and defining that in the SQL query specifier. So I can't really show you any of our connection string, but down here in the SQL Server database connection, if you open the advanced options, you can enter a SQL statement here. So you just enter a SQL query and you do your select specific columns and you've now shrunk the amount of data that Power Query needs to evaluate every time it's working on it. Greg, did you want to follow up on Sorry, that? Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were pausing or not. Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, you know, they, Daniel, you and I, I, we were just saying we don't we don't recommend nesting steps, but I think we had some very limited um, uh, you know success with nesting a a navigation step into a select columns step and and doing that. Um, so like an M, Daniel, can you um, show how you could like select two columns and then do the um, remove other columns, the remove yes. columns step. So let's say I want to make a product table and my first step is actually going to be remove other columns after highlighting these two by holding shift and selecting both of them. And I just click this remove other columns and now I've got a list of, you know, it's not extremely 
uh, unique yet, but I'd be able to accomplish that by filtering. But just by clicking those that those two columns and remove other columns, I've now shortened my table. And I think that helps with passing along smaller tables through the different end steps. So I think it helps in that regard. So if you are working with the data source where you can't control the columns coming in, like you just have to navigate into the table, if you put that select step early on in the process, I think it'll help with the following steps because at least you're getting rid of all the columns you don't need first. And uh, that could help with a uh, with with your performance and refresh, um, and and also just makes your makes it easier for you to to work on your query. Yeah, and um, you know, some of you out there might work with Salesforce, and um, you know, we've we've worked with Salesforce with a few of our clients, and you know, Salesforce can actually be quite um, troublesome to work with. Um, a lot of these Salesforce objects can be up to 300, 400 columns wide. And the Salesforce API, which is leveraged through the Salesforce connector in Power Query, is actually um, delimited by file size and not records. So you're pulling down only somewhere around, you know, 500 kilobytes to a megabyte every second or so. And that can take a very long time to pull a million record table or object that has 400 columns. And it's a little bit too advanced to show an example of, but if any of you out there have questions about how to minimize the amount of columns you're bringing into Power Query from Salesforce, feel free to shoot us an email and we can help you, you know, kind of walk through what, it's, what the syntax is like for selecting columns from a um, Salesforce object because it can, it, you, it can really speed up your um, evaluation time and your refresh time if you are selecting columns from the import but it requires manual M updates and not, uh, there's no way to do it through the GUI. And and I would add for, this works the same also for a D365. Yes, and D365. That's how we, that's how Greg was able to discover this. So, um, you know, if, if any of you have questions about D365 and making sure that you're not pulling in a massive table only to keep five or six columns, then just uh, shoot us an email at BI team at ironedgegroup.com and we'll, we'll help you out with that. Um, when should we transform our data via DAX instead of Power Query in situations where we could use either language? So AJ, it's one, you have to look at your current refresh times um, and you know look at where it's going to be best suited. So if you've got a heavy, heavy DAX report and you know how to accomplish something like a static value that isn't dynamic at all um, in DAX, you can most likely move that over to Power Query. Things like calculated columns, things like dimension tables or DAX tables. You know, if you just need DAX to help you during development, um, it's usually a good idea to move all of that stuff to Power Query M, mainly because it's only going to be evaluated on refresh and not every time a user clicks on something in the report view. So any DAX is going to be evaluated every time a user interacts with the report. Um, using M is usually a little bit more cumbersome, but it's a little bit uh, more beneficial to your users if you're not bloating the report evaluation with DAX everywhere. You know, 15 calculated columns in a table, um, two DAX tables as a specific relationship between two main tables in your data model. Um, However, you know, DAX may be more beneficial for development time if you are better with DAX than you are with Power Query. If you can't seem to crack something in Power Query and you have a deadline, then of course moving things to DAX is going to be better. But once you are able to accomplish that quick step in Power Query, you're gonna see um, a slightly better performance in your, um, in your report, just because you're not evaluating all of this DAX every time a user interacts with the report. So, Nikhil, there is, that's kind of a loaded question. So, there is, I'm not sure if you're familiar. Uh, so, what Nikhil asked is, is it possible to pass parameters from Power BI dashboard to mQuery, just like stored procedures in SQL? So, the answer is yes and no. But first, I'm going to go through strictly Power Query with no front end stuff. So, Power Query can be used to define a parameter. Let's say I, you know, just take one of these text fields. Um, I think I already have that shrunken down product table. 
Um, let's say I filter down to a single one and I only keep this value, right? I can turn this into a parameter by turning it into a list. Let's see here. So before I, before I get caught up in working with the GUI, so I can actually turn this value into a parameter and I can pass that as a variable into my Power Query code. And I can reference it, I can use it in my functions, you know, there's a lot of possibilities in calling your parameters. However, there are times where we have something like this, which is our date query, which um, uses our date. This uh, date query is a function that we can look at the definition of here really quickly. So we're defining start date as end end date as parameters, as well as the culture as an optional parameter. So one thing you need to keep in mind is that the users can actually use these parameters to an extent, however, not in Power BI service. So if you're wanting your users to be able to enter parameters like for a stored procedure and change the evaluation of a query, that can't actually be done in Power BI service, but it can be done from the desktop app. And the way you would be able to do that is by, let's see here, I haven't done it in the new view, so forgive me, everyone. There is under transform data, there is this edit parameters. If I make those parameters loaded into the front end, I can actually edit the parameters. And let's say I made those start date and end dates visible to the front end, then I would be able to click this edit parameters, enter a new start date, enter a new end date, and then be able to change the evaluation of my date dimension. But once again, this is only doable within Power BI Desktop and not the Power BI service. Users can't change the parameters of the data refresh since the data is refreshing automatically and being stored um, in the cloud, not necessarily being refreshed every time a user is looking at it. So, you know, there is the possibility to play with parameters and leverage them as variables within all of your Power Query queries. But overall, no, there's not really an option for allowing the users to change the parameters of your um, queries. Um, I don't see many other questions coming in. Um, is, is everybody good with where we are? So, and we're gonna have this recording later. I'm sorry, if George or someone else is about to say that. Uh. Yeah, so this will be available. The recording will be available. I hope I spent enough time on my slides. Um, I'm not sure if we're sending out the slides as well. Um, we can go ahead and work to get that uploaded into our slide share system. But yep, for all the attendees, we'll be sending out a follow up email. Um, and it'll have the recap of this webinar, the whole entire thing, as well as a few extra resources for you guys to utilize and obviously our contact info in case you guys have any more questions. All right. And this will, this will also appear on our uh, blog. So ironagegroup.com slash, slash blog. Um, there's one other question that came in. Um, when using direct import, what's the best way to develop on a subset of data and then releasing that limit before publishing to the service. Um, so using direct query, um, you're gonna have to define most of your logic in the actual C SQL query that's being brought in because that SQL query is how data is being imported into your data model every time it gets refreshed, whether a user clicks on, a, on anything or whether a user clicks on a visualization, that's when that query gets operated on again. So the only thing you can really do in Power Query, I believe, is slightly filter date selections, but you can also do that within the SQL query as well. So I don't really recommend doing that. Um, overall, it's not recommended to conduct many transformations, if at all, on direct query data. Um, direct query is mainly meant to be querying either views or a predefined SQL query. Every time I've worked with uh, direct query, you, putting all of my logic in direct in my SQL query is going to be much better than doing anything in Power Query. So I hope I hope that answers your question.
So other than that, we do have a, another webinar upcoming on the 30th. It is going to be over the time intelligence slicer. And this isn't uh, the most um, you know, descriptive title, but it's very exciting way to develop your uh, Power BI reports. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of ways that people have tried to do switching methods uh, in their measures, but what this allows you to do uh, instead of creating multiple visualizations that describe different time slices, we've actually, uh, we're going to show you a method for creating your measures and multiple measures that are being uh, used within that measure to be able to use a single visualization and a single output measure to show different time frames of data. It's um, a really, really sophisticated way of developing your Power BI reports that your users um, will find very easy to use, but setting it up is more so a methodology than it is a one size fits all solution, but it really steps up your Power Query, or your Power BI game. So I highly recommend all of you come and check that out. Um, make sure that if you're not in Houston, uh, if you are in Houston, make sure you sign up for our Houston Power BI user group. Um, I believe we have one today, or no, is it today or next week? Next week. <laughs> okay. Um, so we meet usually on the third Thursday of every month. Uh, when all of this is over, you know, we'll be meeting back at the Microsoft office every third Thursday. But for now, we've moved to virtual meetups. And you can sign up and view all that information at one of these two links. Go ahead and go to meetup.com and search Power, Houston Power BI user group or go to the um, Houston Power BI user group um, page where you can find a lot of our actual content and past um, presentations. Yeah, and this stuff uh, shows up pretty easily on Google. So don't yes, worry about these does. links. If you're just Google uh, uh, these, uh, these results and you'll, you'll find it. And finally, the Iron Edge group blog, uh, there you'll find us posting you know, helpful tips and tricks for Power BI, as well as a lot of information uh, regarding our managed service side of the house. Um, there's a lot of good info over there and we like to stay on top of uh, new and exciting things, both in Power BI and IT as a whole. But other than that, I think uh, we are done here if no one else has any questions. So thank you all for joining and uh, we hope to see you at the next one.